What a pleasure. Thank you all for coming, and I hope I can deliver the goods. I came to Rutgers in 2008 with the start of the new year. I spent 25 years before that in state government, most of it at the Department of Environmental Protection, but a wonderful hiatus for 18 months over at the Department of Community Affairs, where I led the, uh, well, I didn't lead, I co-led, the um, Office of Neighborhood Empowerment, which was a community planning program. I got my PhD here in 2002, and I just love it. So when I was shopping around, because I was 55 and I was ready to retire from state government, Mike Greenberg said, well, why don't you come to Rutgers? And I laughed, and he didn't laugh, and I figured out he was really serious. So I'm delighted to be back here. When I submitted my manuscript to Rutgers Press, um, sorry, let me back up. We put out a call about three months before that date for photographs from the Raritan River region. And we got almost a thousand photographs. And everyone was more fabulous than the one before. It was just, it was an arduous task, many hours until two o'clock in the morning, deciding which ones were going to go in the book. The contract I found out the day I turned in my manuscript had a condition of 80 pictures and I had 357. Oops. So I offered uh, Marley Wasserman, I said, I can leave. And she said, that won't be necessary. We'll figure it out. So this book, and I, if you haven't looked at it, <clears throat> you're going to love it. I wanted a coffee table book. Yeah, I'm an academic. I wanted a coffee table book. I wanted something that was on your coffee table, and people said, ooh, what's this? And when they opened it, you could hardly talk about anything but the Raritan because the pictures are so beautiful. And it's, it's such a beautiful area. And when I went to look for that book several years ago, I guess I started it in 2011, there was no book that was focusing on this region. And what a shame because this is truly one of the most beautiful parts of New Jersey. And having grown up in the Midwest and moved to New Jersey with lots of shaming by my colleagues and, and business about the state bird being the mosquito and I don't know what. I fell in love with New Jersey. I was dumbfounded. We moved into the Pinelands and I just couldn't believe that we were in this magical place. It is such a beautiful place. So it was a double privilege for me to write this book and be able to tell everybody this is it. I hope that people would buy it for themselves. I hope they would buy it for their children who lived in California or Utah or Indiana or wherever, so that those children could say, this is the Jersey I'm talking about. Not the freeway and not the stacks, but the beauty of nature in New Jersey. So that's the opening gambit. And I'm going to say two things in terms of promotion. This is a, a quick summary about the book. And it has my email address how to purchase the book, and the website for the Raritan Initiative so that you can track us. And if you're interested, you can sign up and get our monthly newsletter. And that monthly newsletter is drawn from over 130 partners in the Sustainable Raritan River Collaborative, municipalities, local government, state government, county government, federal government, all committed to making this a different place clean it up, and protect it in the future. I was also spurred to do a video because my colleague, Bob Spiegel, did one called, what's it called? Oh, Dawson, come on. All right, it's going to be on TV tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Rescuing the Raritan. Excuse me? Right. And NJN did us a service last year and did reimagining our watershed a renaissance on the Raritan. Because Bob's perspective is totally legitimate, but it's on the side of these are the things that happened badly. And I wanted to say, ah, yes, but there's a bigger story that goes with that. So these are bookends. And I hope you enjoy Bob's show. And um, what I'm supposed to be doing for the next year is working with municipal, um, excuse me, municipal school districts and libraries 
to get them to build a program around the Sustainable Raritan River Initiative and our video. So I'm hoping to meet lots of librarians and lots of school board members. So if any of you have names for me, we'll talk after this, um, especially after you win your book and I sign it for you and you tell me all that information. I also have a brochure for everyone. They're out on the table out there if you miss them. But this just covers the whole area. 98 municipalities, seven counties, a huge effort to get everybody to recognize that they need to look at five key areas of how to manage their futures. And I have to tell you, we have 39 of those municipalities as partners. I'm still working, but apparently there's still only 24 hours in a day. But suffice it to say that it has been a miracle to me to see how many people get it and how many people want to change the way they do things so that they can truly be sustainable in their communities. So we can talk about all of that later. And I'm going to practice pushing the page down button and see what happens. First note, I tried to give credit to all the photographers that you're going to see in this uh, presentation. Mary Ellen Hill did a beautiful picture of the South Branch in Flemington. And that's the first one. I also want to praise the Blaustein School. It's such an honor. I, I know all of you have had some kind of experience like this. But when I reported for my first day, I got to be with colleagues that I have admired for so many years. And now they were my colleagues. And it was just, it was transformation. Uh, Bob Curvin's book, Inside Newark, um, Decline, read, I can't even read it. Re, okay, and the search for transformation. And Bob's book is excellent. It's all about the Newark that needs to be, and Newark is definitely on its way. The second book is New Jersey's Post Suburban Economy, written by my prestigious dean, Jim Hughes, and his prestigious partner, Joe Seneca, who is the economist that was the vice president for finance for many years. Um, and finally, the Judy Shaw book, The Renton River, Our Landscape, Our Legacy. And I had the pleasure of having Mike Greenberg write the introduction for me, my boss, my uh, supervisor of my dissertation. I knew if I got Mike, I'd finish my dissertation because he can be a curmudgeon if you don't do what he says. So it was perfect. So greetings from the Blasting School to all of you. So let me tell you the story of the Sustainable Renton River Initiative and how it became the book. This is the watershed. It's a huge watershed, 1,200 square miles and over 2,000 miles of waterways, including Rocky Brook, the main stem of the Raritan, and hundreds of other small tributaries. And when you look at it, it just takes your breath away, doesn't it? It's huge and it's wonderful. And John Bogner is over at Cressa with Rick. Thank you, John. And Jennifer Revito is my colleague over at the Blaustein School, and they pulled that together like magic, and that's the big picture. During the summer of 2009, oops, I don't know what that was. During the summer of 2009, we, we held our first conference in June of 2009, and the room was supposed to hold 150 people, and uh, the fire marshal didn't show up to find out I had 165 people in the room. So that was good. And after the conference, we called on those who were present and said, we would like any of you that can afford the time to be part of a committee to work on these five topics. These people, engineers, planners, environmentalists, a huge number, I think over 75 people participated in the five committees that met over the course of the summer. Our goal was to write a plan for the region that was so simple and straightforward that what was not to like, and so clearly written that we didn't even need to be there, they could get it. Having worked at the Department of Environmental Protection, particularly in the site remediation area, I was familiar with cases where a piece of property had 18 boxes of papers associated with the cleanup. And it just boggled my mind that we couldn't get our heads around something very simple and straightforward. So 
This was a 10-page report, and I'm sorry I don't have a copy with me, but restoration of water quality. We looked at drinking water, we looked at storm water, we looked at infrastructure, we looked at floodplains, we looked at flood management. That was a huge topic. Access and recreation. Where can people get to the river? And where are the signs showing you how to get to those places? Obviously, in the lower Raritan, we had a tremendous number of facilities, of companies, that bought up right to the river's edge because in the beginning, it was all about getting access to, to water travel so that they could ship their goods to New York. We wanted people to remember that recreation was a joy on the Raritan, that being out on a kayak or a canoe or even swimming was a wonderful way to enjoy this river. Habitat restoration. There are, I believe, 178 species in the wa watershed, and at least 12 of them are endangered or threatened, and we need to restore the habitat for these animals not only for the animals, but for all of us to appreciate and enjoy. The fourth area was brownfield redevelopment. For those of you that are not familiar with that, it's any property that looks bad, isn't being used well, and probably had some permits from DEP during its operation. You may know that in the early 70s, or maybe the early 80s, uh, we passed a law, the Superfund law, Jim Florio, Washington, D.C., and a lot of companies just locked the door and threw away the key because they just couldn't comprehend how much trouble they were in for these facilities. So our goal was to get municipalities to look at these properties for what they are, which is gold mines. We have so many properties in our towns that are underutilized that aren't paying taxes, well, they're paying taxes, but they're modest taxes, and they're drawing down the neighborhoods that they're in instead of raising them up. So we wanted to encourage people to look at these properties as opportunities for good growth. And finally, balanced development, where the environment and the economy are not in competition, but in fact must be together in order to make the kind of future place we want to see. What we wanted to do through the Raritan River Initiative was to get a shared vision for the future, so that was the plan, and we wanted to give educational and professional workshops so that those who were responsible for handling the environment at the local level could, in fact, get to a training session where they could learn about the best management practices that were desired on the part of the Department of Environmental Protection or on the part of EPA in order to restore the quality of the watershed. Um, and before I go on, I want to introduce Alan Godber. Hey, Brother Alan. Alan Godber is the head of the Lawrence Brook Watershed Partnership and has made it his life's ambition uh, to bring people together to restore the quality of that region. And it's been an honor to work with him. Uh, we did a studio for Milltown, and we enjoyed Allen's ability to bring five municipalities together, Milltown being the base for the other five municipalities whose development was creating substantial uh, limits on the ability of the land to absorb the rainwater during storms. And we are making way, right, Allen? Thank you for leading that charge. We have a steering committee for the Sustainable Raritan River Initiative. We also did a, a competition to get a symbol for the Raritan River Collaborative, and that is actually a river otter. It turns out that otters were once very plentiful on the river. They have diminished along with many, many other species. How many sturgeon do you see leaping out of the Raritan by New Brunswick? But um, that was by Bill Bonner, who is a resident and artist in Highland Park. I don't know if you two know him, but... He's a wonderful person. Um, but these are the groups that we asked to be members of our steering committee. We needed guidance, we needed collaboration, we needed coordination, and we needed complementarity. We had to do things that made 
it better for all of these organizations. And the first thing they were worried about was we were going to compete with them. And I said, no, 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 no. We're going to bring it all together. You're going to be the stars. The Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions. Are any of you Environmental Commission members? All right. I'll take it. Uh, Duke Farms Foundation, who has uh, one of my ex-bosses, Michael Catania, running it now. What an organization. What a place. How many of you have been to Duke Farms? That's what I like to see. The New York, New Jersey Baykeeper. Uh, the Baykeeper is Debbie Manns, who grew up on the Detroit River in Michigan, and she is in her element and doing beautiful work. The New Jersey Audubon Society, the New Jersey Water Supply Authority, they are responsible for making sure that they have distribution to the 1.2 million people who drink the water that comes through this region. The Red and Headwaters Association created from a merger between, now I'll leave, I can even remember the name of the two organizations, the South Branch uh, and, holy moly, Alan, Cindy Aaronclue's group. It was the Upper Raritan, indeed. And those two joined forces because they had, in their two parts of the watershed, they had the main sources of the river. And they do wonderful work. Uh, the Rutgers Water Resources Institute is headed by Chris Obrupta over at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. He's magical. He's an engineer with a passion for environment. Uh, the Rutgers Center for Urban Environmental Sustainability, run by Beth Ravitt, another PhD over there. The Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association, which is in Pennington, and they have done a masterful job of engaging families with their kids, they do butterfly programs and water quality testing programs and all kinds of things to make sure that everybody in that region is paying attention and doing what they can. And the final piece is the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, which is run by Michelle Byers, and they have been preserving land all over the state, and that's really what we need to do, is we need to get that land into the public domain so that it can be protected in the long run. So that steering committee advises us on a regular basis, and I'm very grateful to all of them for all they do because I'm just a facilitator. These guys are the muscle on the meat. So I'd like to introduce Joe Mish. Joe Mish is a passionate nature photographer, and this is the source of the South Branch up in Mount Olive. It's from Bud Lake, and that blue heron is not stuffed. He's real. Um, but that's the beginning of the South Branch. How many of you have been to Ken Lockwood Gorge? Am I talking about magic? Woo! My parents used to take me to the Rocky Mountains, and I went to Ken Lockwood Gorge, and I went, I'm home. This is it. It is so beautiful. And I, there are a series of photographs in the book of a kayaker in the height of the wild season, just paddling through that and taking all kinds of risks. Get a helmet on. But just it's just gorgeous. And it's a great, I think it's a trout stream at that point. And people love fishing there. And it's wonderful. And thanks to Thomas Noop, who happened to hear about this in the final hour. And I slipped it in. This is from my colleagues at the Fish and Wildlife Program at DEP. And it is the picture that graces the cover of the book. And it's very special for a couple of reasons. One, you can see a dam across there. Two, you can see the erosion taking place on the banks. And three, you can see it's beautiful. Um, the erosion on the banks is being addressed through a terrific effort on the part of many of our partners to restore the conservation zone along the waterfront. That wouldn't have happened had people not mowed right up to the edge or torn out the trees. But as they pulled out the roots that held everything together, there was crumbling and all of it went into the sediments into the river. Uh, the dam, we have in the watershed, <clears throat> when I came from DEP, <clears throat> there were 99 recorded dams in the Office of Dam Safety. And that office is responsible for making sure that <clears throat> dams are safe but they were finding that there were many, many hazardous conditions associated with dams. 
And what they also found out was that a lot of these dams were privately owned and the owners weren't even aware of their liability or their responsibility. And thanks to a friend of mine named John Django, who is a geologist by training, but works for MWH Engineering, and the, his clients who are redeveloping in Woodbridge, they went to the Department of Environmental Protection and said, we have natural resource damages that we need to pay, and we want to pay that back by taking down dams. And they have taken three down, the first three in the river, and they have restored the anagemous fish passages. Anybody know what anagemous is? They come back upstream. They migrate up, they spawn, their young are there, and then they go out to the ocean again. And with all those dams in place, they couldn't get anywhere. And Alan has been spearheading an effort to get fish ladders on the two dams on the Lawrence Brook to try and restore the fisheries there. And he's doing a wonderful job. We saw a presentation two weeks ago that really inspired all of us. So that's, that's the story, and that dam is now gone. This is the family homestead for the family that gave their property to the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. And this is where their offices are. It's a lovely building, and it's right in the middle, nestled into a gorgeous 1,700-acre property, and we are very grateful to them for all the work they do. This is the Raritan Bay by my friend Bill Schultz. Bill, you're not here, right? Bill Schultz is the river keeper. And I thought we were going to probably knock it down and drag it out when I arrived on the scene, but he very graciously handed the reins over to me. And Bill is an amazing photographer. He's also an amazing individual. And if you Google him, Bill Schultz Riverkeeper, you'll inevitably find video where Bill is doing magical work on, on the part of all of us. And then there's the discovery that the four seasons make it all the more beautiful. Barbara Frankenfield is a nature photographer from, I'm going to have to make it up, I'll just say Somerset County. And she had photographs I wanted to die for. And I wasn't going to talk about winter on the river, but when I saw this, how could I not talk about how beautiful it is in winter? So this is from the Rock Brook. Is that where you guys are? Rock Brook? No, Rocky Brook, right? But it's just gorgeous. And then... I did something rather unusual. I'm going to stand up if I can. Okay. I got so many photographs of birds, of butterflies, of trees, of animals, of dragonflies, that I put a section in the middle of the book. It's just the pictures that these represented. They're so beautiful. And what I wanted was I wanted a children's book nestled in the middle. And I wanted the parents to show their kids these pictures and talk about how intricately related everything is in the watershed so that their children would have a strong sense of pride in their watershed and everything that lived in it. And the Web of Life is a game that I used to teach as a teacher back in Michigan where you took a ball of yarn and each of you is now an animal, a plant, a rock, a sun, a pond, a stream, anything. And you pass the ball of yarn from yourself to someone, something you were related to. And by the end of the game, of course, it's strung all over the place and everybody's connected to everybody else. And that's the magic of eighth grade science. <laughs> so that was the web of life in the middle of the book. And this was just fun to do. Um, on the left is Penny Carlson's photograph. Penny works in the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, so she's our secret weapon. Um, the picture next to it is Tara Pantaleo, thank you very much. And she's the head of the uh, alliance, the uh, Kingston Greenway Alliance. And you can see that on her day job, she delivers the mail. But she is a wonder woman for all the work she does on behalf of all of us in her region. And then Bill Bonner's photographs. 
Bill's an artist of the first order. You saw his little sketch of the um, otter, but this is a shot of the water. And he just makes it all look so beautiful. And this group right here is the crew team from Rutgers. And where's Christina? Your buddy's in the picture, and my little buddy. And then Angel Escalante, who lives right across from Boyd Park, submitted this photograph. And I'm telling you, it just took my breath away. It's absolutely magical. And I loved every one of the photographs. And I was proud to have them all in the book. Susan Nider takes the train from Princeton into New Brunswick every day. Didn't she get the best idea out of this one with a rainbow? And surely the pot of gold is in the Raritan. So this is uh, Lake Carnegie. This is Penny Carlson's photograph from Caliphon of the South Branch. Oh, so beautiful. And our history is part of this as well. Uh, the Dutch settlers were the first ones to come from Europe in this region. And this is the Van Wickle House in Franklin. It's next to uh, Rutgers Prep. And it's one of the original houses in the region. And they keep it open. They keep it up, and they have events there on a regular basis. And I was there pulling weeds one day because they were working on the garden. And I got to meet the people who were head of the program over the weeds. These folks, oh my goodness, do any of you know Sudam Insurance? This is Abe Sudam on the far left. They are, uh, I'm going to have to make it up, but maybe 13th generation. They celebrated this year their 300th anniversary on the farm. Abe has been a, a trust, board of trustees member at Rutgers for many years. His daughter Robin and his son Reich run the insurance business. And the bubble in the middle is Anne, and she is a pistol. Um, she's part of the Herriton, uh, excuse me, the Raritan Millstone Historical. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I owe you. Heritage Alliance. They had their 60th wedding anniversary. Ooh! Schultz and company. They were having their 60th wedding anniversary, and Reich and Robin are characters, and they said, well, we better find out what you get people for their 60th wedding anniversary, and they found out it was heifers. <laughs> so they gave them two heifers, and they're now on an adjacent dairy farm. You know, we used to have over 400 dairy farms in New Jersey, and I think we're down to like 80 maybe. So we've got some growing to do in the agricultural community, and these guys are part of it. The artists were magnificent. I had the pleasure of meeting, um, oh God, you'd think I'd have a brain here, Kathleen Palmer, who with her husband, Peter Palmer, are the ambassador and first lady of Somerset County. And... She has an art gallery called, yep, Seventh, I can't even do it. Okay, fine. But she has a wonderful art gallery. And she said to me, we did a sponsored arts competition for the Headwaters a few years ago, and we'd like to do something for the whole Raritan and work with you. And I was deeply touched and honored. So on the left is Buttermilk Falls, and on the right is Mellick Orchards. And Judith Hummer and Carol Livingston are two of our living assets for reasons you can see. These are also living assets. Nine jerks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine is behind the camera. And that's Bill on the left. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Endangered Rivers Canoe and Kayak Squad. And Carl Alderson is behind the camera. These are folks with completely varied backgrounds. Bill's the river keeper. He's a firefighter. He's a, a boat captain, a magical person. The guy next to him runs um, the Gaia Project out of New York. And the rest of them are equally well-known in their fields. They're chemists. They're geologists. They're uh, social science people. And... They started at the top up in Bud Lake and came all the way down the river. And one of them would say, oh, look at that. And the others would go, what? 
And they would teach each other about their fields. And by the time they got to the bottom of the river, they all knew more about each aspect of what made this a wonderful river. And I'm proud to say this is the only river of its size that's 100% in New Jersey. We don't share it with Pennsylvania. We don't share it with New York. It's ours. And oddly enough, it seems that one of the reasons it was neglected for so long was because it was ours, and we didn't have to fight with New York or Pennsylvania to keep it up. But now things are definitely changing, and it's really wonderful. So hats off to Nine Jerks. Duke Farms. These are called floating islands. Duke Farms had, at one point, I think 13 lakes that were fed from the Raritan River. They have subsequently taken their dam down. Uh, that was the third dam to come down. And what would happen in these lakes over the summer is there would be enough phosphorus and nitrogen coming off of the properties that the algae would just clog up all the lakes. So they hired Princeton Hydro, which is a firm in our region and um, highly committed to restoring nature as a part of their engineering work. And they created these floating islands that, for want of a better term, are like Brillo pads. And they're about this thick. And what they did was they planted land plants on these floating islands. And their roots, hanging down in the water, took up the nitrogen and the phosphorus to the point where 99% of the phosphorus and nitrogen are now being pulled out by these floating islands. And you can see the quality of the water. And it's beautiful. This is the Willow School. Speaking of the Johnson family, um, it's run by Gretchen Johnson's daughter and her husband, um, Mark Biedron. Gretchen Biedron and Mark Biedron. And Michael Chadroff is one of their teachers. And he takes the students out on the creek on their property to look at the macroinvertebrates so they can identify the quality of their water based on the type of macroinvertebrates that are surviving. Certain ones survive only at pristine levels. Certain ones will survive practically anything. And they were happy to report that they had the kind that survived with high levels of quality. And this is in PPAC Gladstone. And these are the young people who will be taking our jobs and doing a good job because no matter where they go, they understand the value of environmental quality. This is another picture of Lake Carnegie from Princeton in some years past, but it is absolutely a magnet for the people. When it ices over, everybody goes down to ice skate, and as you can see, it's just a regular confab and everybody's having a good time. Oh, Tam Stewart, a retired chemist who loved taking pictures. And this is the short-eared owl that he found at Paul, ba Paul Farm in Lawrence Township. And I almost couldn't put the credit on it because it just distracted from how gorgeous that beautiful picture is. Kingston Greenway Alliance, speaking of Tara Pantaleo, uh, this is one of her assistants and the students from the community looking at macroinvertebrates, again, to test the quality of the water and find out what they could find out about their future jobs. New Brunswick has Raritan River Day. I think you know about that. It's the, what, third weekend in September every year. And this year, I think, will be the 33rd. And I put a posting up at the Blaustein School, and I said, if you have a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout badge in canoeing, or you're skilled at canoeing and can demonstrate your abilities, we need you for this event. The Recreation program over at Werblin uh, on the Piscataway campus gave us canoes for the day. And that's one of my students in the back. That's Andy. And we had one Rutgers student at the stern. And the families got in the boat. And I think we had one that had, oh, four. <laughs> and one of the women who took the canoe ride shouted out from the, sh t from the middle of the river, this is the best day of my life. I go, to I go to Princeton every day and I see the crew out there and I've never been on this river. And that's what we do. We get people to connect with their beautiful place. 
This is from Alan Godber, the Lawrenceburg Watershed Partnership, taking a hike in the winter to show people what they have in all seasons. This is Frank Villafagne, and oh, Frank, he lives in Asbury Park, and he's a magician too. This is his picture from Perth Amboy, and you can see that, yeah, during the day it could be something that's rescuing the Raritan, but this photograph makes it look magical, and that's what we love about it. And these two, such wonderful characters. How many of you know about the Middlesex Greenway? Good. How many of you have ridden on the Middlesex Greenway? Okay, that's you, Alan. That's your challenge. Get your bike, get out to the Greenway. Uh, Mike and Ann are cyclists of the First Order. For her birthday, uh, maybe what, 10 years ago, Mike got Ann a bicycle, and they were biking home, and it started to rain, and she got hit by somebody who wasn't looking for bicyclists. And they got home and determined that she was going to be okay, but she couldn't walk as well as she could. And Mike said, that's fine. I'm going to create a bike that you can ride on with me. And that's what they do. And he has been a solid partner with Middlesex County Parks and done incredible things for our community. And our hat's off to Mike and Ann. And this is another wonderful story from Perth Amboy. Um, Rosengarten Realty is run by an absolutely energized individual named Barry Rosengarten. And he heard one day that Princeton was replacing their sailing fleet with new boats. So he called Princeton and he said, I want to buy your old fleet. And he did. And he gave them to Perth Amboy High School. And for the first time since the 1960s, the kids were out on the water in their own community. And these kids are so good that they are taking championships left and right. And they are absolutely enthralled with their river. Um, behind them there, can you see sort of a rusty brown looking pipe? The city of New Brunswick, excuse me, the city of Perth Amboy is one of the last places that has um, combined sewer overflows which by definition is if there's a massive rainstorm, the sewer system picks up anything that discharges from the sanitary system. And they are now in the process of removing those so that they can get their beach back. Because some of you probably remember this, but back in the 60s and before, Perth Amboy was one of the greatest recreational retreats in the state of New Jersey. And the people that live there now just had no sense of that save the people in the historical commission. So we are putting that back together. And God bless New Brunswick. Um, a guy named Mike Blackwell is the head of recreation for the city. And I called him on a Monday and I said, Mike, we need a fishing derby. And he said, OK, when do you need it? I said, well, we've got people coming out on Saturday to take the pictures. And Mike pulled it together in a heartbeat, and the kids have never left their poles, they love it there, and it was a wonderful day to see the kids getting connected to their own river. This is from Brett Kent. These are kids that he took out, I'm gonna say in the late 80s, when he was still teaching high school up in Bernardsville, and they're out at Sandy Hook, and they're doing the same thing everybody else is doing there, collecting samples to identify what's there and what the status is, and now these kids must be out there somewhere making great changes in the businesses and the schools and the other things that they're doing. I hope they ran for public office. This, Rebecca McClellan Crawley, I think I misspelled her name. These are her students, the eighth graders, the boy on the right and the girl on the left. And they learned about water quality and about watersheds. And they went down and taught the third graders everything they knew so that the third graders could learn that it was their responsibility, too, to take care of the watershed. She is now head of science programs for um, Plainsboro, hyphen, the town next door. And they have us. West Windsor, thank you very much. And they have an extraordinary program, and she is doing the same thing there that she did in Perth Amboy. It's absolutely wonderful. 
This is the coach barn at Duke Farms. And when you walk into that room and you see the murals, you realize how absolutely elegantly wealthy the Dukes were because the coach barn is absolutely glorious. And this is our annual conference. Oh, and look, there's Schultz right there in the front. And Lorraine. <laughs> um, so this is where we gather about 200 people to hear what everybody else is accomplishing. Because as soon as you hear that that town over there did that, you're like, we can do that too. And we're going to be the ones talking next year. And they've done extraordinary work. And we're very proud of all that they do. And this is the last picture. This is the Judy Shaw photograph. Um, this is the New Brunswick Study Club. Have any of you ever heard of it? The New Brunswick Study Club was started by graduates of Douglas College. Anybody a Douglas College graduate? All right. They graduated in um, 19 oh everything. And they said, we need something to do with our research skills. And we need to keep ourselves viable and learning. And so they created the New Brunswick Study Club. They picked a topic. And each month, one of them did a presentation on the topic. And they did extraordinary work, which is housed right here in this library. Um, and this was Anne. The issue was transportation. And this is Anne talking about their trip to Alaska on the Trans-Alaskan Highway. And it was a wonderful gathering. And it was a joy to be with them and celebrate their joy of learning. They, I quoted them in the book because they did, one year they did the, um, the wetlands legislation that was passed in New Jersey. So I think that's it. Oh, this is the last one. Fred Gardner, a, ma a master with uh, watercolors. And I thought his picture was in the book. And Fred got the book, and he was so excited, and he called me, and he said, that's not my picture. So when it goes on the auction block as a famous book, <clears throat> and yours is worth millions of dollars, uh, Fred Gardner's picture won't be in there. But in honor of Fred's contribution, that is Fred's picture. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. These are my thank you to all the people who contributed photographs. And this is the information that you have on this sheet my email address, our website, and where you can buy the book. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Need I say, it's just been such a pleasure for me to work with everybody in this watershed. Excitement, joy, determination, everything. And it all works. And everybody is meeting everybody else, and the partnerships are blossoming all over the place. So I'm here to talk about what you want to talk about, and thank you very much for all of it.